for Crema Media's Polity, I'm Lungile Ngongfe. Joining me is renowned cartoonist Jonathan Shapiro, aka Zapiro, here to discuss his latest collection of cartoons titled Ramapocalypse Now. Ramapocalypse Now highlights the comical and tragic events playing out in South Africa and the rest of the world. What is your assessment of the current political environment here and abroad? <laughs> I'm reminded of an old Peanuts cartoon uh, where you get an, an exam paper and it says use both sides of the paper if necessary. Uh, that's quite a broad question. I don't want to say anything too bleak, but I think the situation here is pretty dire uh, in in South Africa. Um, I'm I think there's there's an enormous uh, anger and uh, frustration among pretty much the whole country uh, with how badly things have turned out in the last few years, uh, having started out with, you know, 30 years, we're 30 years of democracy coming up in 2024. And we made a very promising start. There was a lot going for this country had a lot of political capital. We had a leader like Nelson Mandela. We had other leaders with a lot of wisdom. And I feel that one of the biggest mistakes that was made was the dissolution by the ANC of the United Democratic Front, the internal, uh, above ground, uh, younger people who weren't in exile and weren't in jail and who were in touch with what was happening. And I feel that the ANC over the decades has become less and less in touch and has become fatter and more comfortable and has become more corrupt. Uh, so I feel that right now, as much as I would like to say that this is going to be a watershed election, it's going to be tough because at least there are independents out there now and who are allowed to take part. Uh, at least there are some other exciting new parties like Rise and Zansi. I don't think they are going to make enough impact. Um, I'm hoping they will. I'm also hoping that, that there are some other restructurings that are going to happen amongst opposition and even amongst what little is left of the kind of left wing or the progressive part of the ANC. Um, but in a sense, it looks like we're going to be in a holding pattern with with a few changes and more coalitions after this election. So we have the massive power problem, Eskom. We've got massive corruption. We've got massive crime. We've got a lot of apathy. Um, it's going to be tough the, these next these next couple of years. The 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 economy is contracting even more. Uh, there, there's less to kind of work with. So yeah, and obviously around the world that. Things are tightening uh, economically. The climate change issue is massive. The COP is happening right now. And um, we we in South Africa have not done nearly enough. So, yeah, that, uh, that sounds a bit bleak, but I'm always hoping that also the, the media focus and the, the, the media, we, we do have a strong media. We do have strong civil society. We, we have those kind of marginal progressive politics and politicians. So maybe something can happen. Who knows? It's hope. Humor and pathos are certainly delivered in each of your cartoons. With this in mind, what continues to drive your pursuits of social justice? You know, a cartoonist is a, a little bit of a different animal. If I wake up in the morning and I feel outraged. Um, it may be a good day for me as a cartoonist. I, I, I don't want to be outraged as a South African or as an activist or as a as a, a committed person, hopefully with progressive politics, but as a cartoonist, that that outrage, the fact that I'm passionate about what goes on, uh, and have and I haven't lost that passion, is what helps to drive me. And then finding ways to say things by surprising people—that's really what what also drives me. I, I, I have this fantastic platform. It's an unusual genre. Uh, cartooning, editorial cartooning. It, it mixes comics, it mixes uh, words and, and, and images. It, it is part art, it's part journalism. It's, um, it's something weird. I'm allowed to be rude there by convention. And um, um, no, no ruder really than any other citizen. But, but there's a sort of convention that we can do. And it drives me to try and uh, find ways that are surprising to link things, uh, whether or not that's through humor or whether it is through, as you you use the word pathos, um, or 
through outrage, uh, making the reader as outraged as I am, um, or anger. And, and it can, can just be a simple cerebral connection, uh, something that's surprising, that links things that you didn't expect and allows you to see something in a slightly different way. To have a chance to communicate that, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a rare thing that I, that I have and I've been able to do that for sort of 30 years, really, of, of the same amount as the democracy, of, of doing it as, as part of a kind of daily editorial uh, cartooning stuff. So I, I love it. And you mentioned some of the professional qualities that go into producing a great cartoon. I suppose what I'm trying to do is to communicate my thoughts and not as a reporter. Cartooning is not reporting. Cartooning is being a visual commentator, a visual columnist. And so I, I try and almost separate the content from the vehicle. And I first think, what is it I'm trying to say? What, what, what interests me? What am I trying to say about a subject that in interests me? Does it then connect with other things? I, I kind of do mind maps. I do a very kind of left brain thing of, of listing things and, and listing my attitudes towards them and trying to find out what I'm trying to say. Once I do that, I then think, well, that could be funny or that is pretty outrageous or that is... A, a lot of dialogue. It, it, it'll feel like I'll need to do maybe a comic strip. Then I, I've got to try and find the vehicle to say it. Where, is it a comic strip? Is it going to be one panel? Is it going to be two panels? Two panels vertically, two panels horizontally. Uh, there's been multiple ways of communicating these things. Does it end up feeling like it's going to be a sitcom or a conceptual drawing? If it's a sitcom, it's all about getting things to scale and and making everything in the situation comedy as one would see on on TV um, or you know that that that's a kind of situation comedy uh, it's just all in the dialogue or do I really want to show something in a very startling conceptual way like let's say the the world as a as a bomb uh, for, that's a conceptual drawing as opposed to to a sitcom. And then, I, yeah, maybe it's a parody of an advert. Maybe it's a parody of a movie um, or a TV series or something like that. Pop culture becomes very much part of it. Used in, in olden in eras of cartooning, it was more sort of uh, classical references. And these days, pop culture is a kind of a better, um, it, it, you know, one would use that more often because it would speak to more people. Um, and yeah, then, and once I find those things, then, then I've got to hope for the right brain thing, the real strange connection stuff to kick in and take it to the next level. Instead of just a good cartoon, maybe hopefully a really good one or a great one, uh, if I'm lucky. What are the key challenges associated with holding onto the comical value of your cartoons and retaining the integrity of your message? I think that I'm not always looking for something that's funny, but when you're looking for a way to expose hypocrisy, which is what I'm often trying to do, or when you're looking for a way to communicate the moral outrage and you find that the, the, the humorous side of it, not making a joke that's going to make the reader laugh at the protagonist in the cartoon who's who's being hypocritical or you, you know you're showing that side i'm wanting to punch up uh, that's one of the most important things uh, punching down isn't funny so you know if you're punching in a sense stereotyping a group of people or something that's not funny you if you are really knocking a politician uh, a pompous politician off his or her pedestal you're hitting a corporation where it really hurts and showing the hypocrisy you're looking at a political party and uh, and and showing that what they say today is not what they said yesterday or what they say today is not what they do and that dissonance is easy for people to see you'll find something funny there and that i, I would say to answer your question that would retain the sort of integrity of the kind of humor i'm looking for because i'm not looking to denigrate a group of people or something like that that would in my set my my feeling not be funny i've seen some cartoonists who do that uh, but it's not not what i aim to do at all 
you have any personal regrets linked to your body of work as a cartoonist? Yeah, you know, you asked me a really tough question. Um, I would say that um, I'm not even going to go into it now, but there's one cartoon, you know, where I, if I could, you know, turn the clock back and say, well, I, I, you know, I didn't read the room. Uh, I, and I tell you, it's not the Rape of Justice cartoon, and it's not even the cartoon that I received death threats for or anything like that, because uh, I've received death threats for a number of cartoons. Um, but there's there's one where you see, I think in the last in the last fifteen years with social media and the way that um, that echo chambers work and the way that things can be taken out of context, and not only in cartooning, but in various fields, people can kind of round on you, take one little aspect of something out of context and highlight that and ignore everything else and sort of misrepresent it and act as if you are a bigot or a racist or whatever it is, and you can be destroyed in a day or a week or a couple of weeks and it nearly happened to me so that would be the the biggest regret was everything around that um other than that i mean i really feel like i've had a phenomenal run i've been incredibly lucky as a privileged white male in a country that's changing and where i'm you know in the most privileged sector of society uh and um i had you know there was at least a decade, almost 15 years, where a lot of people would, if I met them, uh, say when I was at the Sowetan, one of the most gratifying things for me is that I would meet people and they'd say, I didn't, I didn't know you were white. Uh, I, I thought you were a black South African. Um, and which made me feel like, you know, I really have been able to tap into being a South African and trying to be a South African with a progressive um, agenda and progressive politics. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, there, there may be a few regrets, but in general, I've had an incredible time doing what I do. Freedom of expression seems to be under threat all around the world, including here in South Africa. What do you think should be done to better promote freedom of speech? I value the organizations that fight for freedom of expression because I do feel that Although I, I enjoy the idea of democratizing platforms where people ha can have a say, I think that the, the, the people in groups, when they feel a, a level of sort of anonymity on, on social media, or when one group sort of um, uh, railing against another, they, uh, people can be pr quite scary in groups, however they do things. And I do feel that the organizations that protect the rights, that focus carefully on those rights, I think that those groups must be supported. I think that the rule of law must be supported by civil society and by, and by media. Um, and, I, and I think that through, through those kind of mechanisms, a bigger proportion of the public can start to see the value in having freedom of expression really protected so that people are actually engaging on, on issues and, and not using that freedom to limit the rights of others. Ramapocalypse Now will certainly entertain viewers following a year of sizable challenges. Overall, how would you like your latest installment of cartoons to be remembered? I think that doing an, an annual, it feels like I get that chance to encapsulate the, the year on the cover and, and with the title, and then also by the kind of editing and, and the way that I tell the story. Uh, over the last decade, I've had my friend Mike Wills helping me with the, the captions. We, 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 we structure and order things a little bit, but it's generally chronological. But I think if it becomes a, a valuable part of whatever it is I've created over the last 30 years, and, and these are, it's the 28th annual, and when I go and sign my books at, uh, at bookshops or when I'm at a, a convention like Comic-Con or whatever it is where I go, I meet young people and um, I find that the generation after me and the generation after that come up to me and from across the board, from all kinds of schools and all kinds of backgrounds, and they say, I've been understanding the world in history through your cartoons or in English or in 
some other languages where they translate the cartoons or in uh, economics or in art. And the cartoons are debated. So if my annual and the cartoons themselves are being looked at by the following generations and people are, are still feeling that they are relevant and that they help them understand the world in a different way and, and laugh at the world in a, bit, in a different way and read between the lines. It's one of the most important things. Uh, it, it's something that Mad Magazine explicitly were trying to sort of teach Americans and anyone else who was looking uh, back in the, in the 50s and 60s in particular. Some of the great Mad, Mad Magazine cartoonists attended an editorial cartooning convention, which I went to more than 30 years ago. And I remember that so well from them. And I'm finding that that is something that uh, some young people are getting from looking at my cartoons and, and from engaging with them. And uh, if, if this annual and, and my previous annuals can help people do that, then that's something I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of. That was Zapiro discussing his latest collection of cartoons titled From Apocalypse Now.